this conversation provides an opportunity to meet and engage with Dr. Brown and local economic and community leaders on the future of workforce in Portland and PCC's role in training and supporting and enhancing that workforce towards greater economic vitality for the region. As I mentioned, I am associated with the Extended Learning Campus, and the Extended Learning Campus incorporates the college's non-credit community and workforce programs. I'd like to take a moment to ask Bob Hanks and Pamela Murray to introduce themselves and their workforce programs within PCC. Bob? Good morning, everybody. A lot of familiar faces here and some new faces, but uh, just a little bit about the Klein Center. We served over 11,000 customers and clients last year, primarily uh, with uh, training for incumbent workforce. Um, we have programs that are located here, on site, online, on ground, hybrid. We'll put together training in any fashion that you want it. We have four different programs located here at the Climb Center, our small business development center. And I'm going to ask Tammy to stand up real quick so you could visit with uh, her maybe afterwards. She's our director for our Small Business Development Center. Yeah. Health Professional Training is the largest program we have, and Sheila Me Messerschmidt is a director for that program. Uh, another program we have, everything other than health care, primarily customized training, is our professional development training program, and Willie Fisher is a director for that program. And we have another program called Life by Design, which is for baby boomers that are making the next step, the transition to either retirement or some type of supplemental income or uh, doing something else fun in those later years in life. But after we get done with the formal session, uh, we'll have a, some time next door and I encourage you to come and grab one of us if you want to know more about the Klein Center. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, my name is Pamela Murray, and I'm the Dean of Workforce Economic and Community Development for the college. And in as such, I get to serve over the division that works with uh, both WIA programs and the Department of Human Services programs, providing unemployment or <laughs> providing them with unemployment. No, <laughs> providing <laughs> providing individuals who are unemployed or underemployed. Uh, job training and on-the-job training and occupational training in order to get them back into work. And I'd like to introduce the two directors, if they're both here. Ken Dodge is in charge of our Willow Creek facility, then, which is also a WorkSource center. And Andrew here is from the WorkSource and Work Systems Inc. And then Amy, are you here this morning? Amy's out. Okay, well, Amy Youngflesh. Uh, also within the division is the Career Pathways Program, which is short-term training, again, designed to help people who are unemployed get back into um, a job as quickly as possible, usually within six months. And Kate Kinder is here, and she is the director of the Career Pathways Program. And finally, finally a program that you probably know pretty well is our Community Education Program, which provides all sorts of classes all around the city um, for anybody who's interested in learning multiple things. Tanya Booker is our director there. <coughs> so thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Jessica. Thanks, Bob and Pamela. And now I'd like to properly introduce our brand new president of Portland Community College, our sixth president, Dr. Jeremy Brown, who, as you will notice as soon as he begins speaking, that he is from England, Manchester, England, in fact. Mm -hmm. And he has previously served as the president of colleges in Long Island and in Pennsylvania. Prior thereto, he was the provost and vice president for academic affairs at the State University of New York in Canton. He also served as the chief ex uh, executive officer of Florida State University, Panama, which is an American university in Latin America. So if he goes right into Spanish, we know where that came from. <laughs> Dr. Brown is a physicist by training. He earned both his Bachelor of Science and PhD in physics from the University of Birmingham in England his doctoral work in experimental nuclear physics was conducted at both the University of Birmingham and the University of California, Berkeley. Brown began his work in academic administration when he became an associate dean of the graduate school at Yale University and later as associate dean of faculty at Princeton University. Dr. Brown is a Manchester United football fan, but is quickly learning to appreciate our Portland Timbers. Please give a round of applause for Dr. Brown. 
And now I'd like to uh, introduce our distinguished panel for today's workforce discussion. Elizabeth King is the Director of organizational, uh, Organization Development for ESCO Corporation at its corporate headquarters located here in Portland. ESCO Corporation began in 1913 and is a privately held global steel manufacturing company. Elizabeth serves as a member of the ESCO Steering Committee that began the implementation of lean, lean processing, called QVS, Quality, Value, and Speed. As a leading expert in lean processing, Elizabeth was appointed by Governor Kulongoski, is a past chair of the Oregon Workforce Development Board, and is currently co-chair of the Oregon Statewide Manufacturing Strategy. Please help me welcome Elizabeth King. <laughs> also here with us is Oregon State Representative Jeff Reardon. Jeff Reardon represents Outer Southeast Portland and portions of Clackamas County in the Oregon legislation. L <laughs> I'm sorry. He currently serves as a, a big typo. He currently serves as the vice chair of the education committee and sits on agriculture and uh, natural resources and energy and environment. He is a Vietnam era veteran who served on a nuclear submarine in the Western Pacific. His naval science earned him the GI Bill so he could afford to become the first college graduate in his family. He holds a bachelor's degree in education from Western Washington University. Jeff was a teacher in the Park Rose School District where he taught industrial arts for five years before taking a job at Tektronix where he worked for 24 years. He served for a decade in the De David Douglas School Board and later taught career technical education at David Douglas High School, recently retiring in June. Please welcome Representative Reardon. And next we have Andrew McGough. Andrew McGough is the Executive Director of Work Systems Inc. He's been in that role since 2006 and brings nearly 20 years of workforce development experience to the organization and has been engaged with workforce and human service programs and policy at the national, state, and local levels. Prior to joining Work Systems, Andrew started two successful nonprofit organizations and worked as a consultant offering a variety of management and organizational development services. He's a recognized expert in workforce program development and performance management and is a frequent speaker at national, state, and regional events. Andrew has a master's degree from Roosevelt University with a dual concentration in economics and public policy. He is also a certified Six Sigma black belt from Villanova University. Thank you for coming. Please help me welcome <laughs> Andrew McGough. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Chris Lyon, who is co-founder and president of Mud Shark Studios. Chris Lyon is the 31-year-old co-founder of this Portland, Oregon-based studio company. Along with his business partner, Lyon has built the company in a mere six-year span from its humble origins in a po Portland basement to what is one of the largest subcontract ceramic manufacturers in the United States. With help from the Small Business Development Center at PCC, CLIMB, Mud Shark is a true locally grown success story. Last year, Chris was flown to New York City where Mud Shark was honored by Martha Stewart as one of the craft makers of the year, this is quite something, through the American <laughs> Made Awards. Help me welcome Chris Lyon. <laughs> and last, immediately to my right, is Heather Larry, manager of Nursing Education for Providence Health and Services. Heather is currently the manager of Nursing Education for Providence Health and Services. She's responsible for all aspects of coordination of system-sponsored scholarship loans, which includes student selection, student support, clinical coordination, job placement, loan forgiveness, and loan repayment. She's responsible for coordinating the implementation of regional initiatives. She works with educators from eight hospitals and multiple outpatient facilities to establish teaching and implementation tools for staff. Heather has a Master's of Science in Nursing from the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, where I'm from. Good, good. <laughs> and, her, and she has her Bachelor of Science in Nursing at the University of Nevada, Reno. Please help me welcome Heather. And last, before I turn it over to this wonderful uh, dialogue that you'll be um, involved with, I'd like to let you know that you have a sheet in the, the handout that asks you to brainstorm a, uh, any number of BHAGs, which stands, stands for Big, Hairy, Audacious Goals, 
as PCC considers its role in a rapidly changing future with regard to education and, and um, workforce. So please feel free to jot those down and uh, we hope to hear all your good ideas when you turn those in at the end of the session. Without any further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Jeremy Brown. Thank you. Um, well, good morning and, uh, and thanks for being here today. It's really important that we sort of engage in a really broad-based dialogue within our district. And, and our district, as people keep reminding me, is the size of Rhode Island, which um, I never quite get a grasp of that until you're actually here and have to drive uh, through town. But um, it's a really fascinating time for us, uh, and a crucial one, frankly. Things are going remarkably well at PCC, I, I must admit. And I, you know, Preston, who was my predecessor, did a great job and, and left so many wonderful things moving uh, us forward. So it makes my job even more difficult, as you might imagine. But um, it's also an opportunity. When things are going well, this is the time to start thinking about what else can we do? Well, what other directions should we follow? And what other opportunities are out there? Couple that with the idea that we're under embarking right now on a significant strategic plan for the college, which is going to, in essence, vision us for five years in all of the things that we do. So this is part and parcel of, of getting feedback from you as a result of that. And as I said, it is really important because we are a college for the community. In essence, that's what a community college does. And it sort of signals all of the different things that really encompass a community college's mission these days. And really, we have to think a little bit more about what we do. If we imagine over 50 years ago, we were formed primarily for you know, the one and the two year associates and certificate programs. And then over time, we've evolved into a very different institution. And when you, I think about it, I have a hard time grasping all of the things that we do, all of the people that we reach. And we're not alone in that. In the United States, 45% of all undergraduate students are in community colleges. And it's unusual. And 40% of the graduating class from Portland State start at PCC. We also provide workforce development, community ed, small business development, ESL, GED, you name it. Anything that somebody wants in terms of education who are either in high school or beyond high school, who don't want to go to a four-year school, we are that option. And we have to, in essence, make sure that we manage to reach out uh, to provide those opportunities to everybody who's looking for an education. So it's really a dynamic institution that stretches in, in many different dimensions as, as the needs arise. And your needs are our future. That's why we want to hear from you today and want to sort of start teasing some questions out of the panel, which will hopefully lead to questions from you about our future, our collective future. It is a partnership. It's a partnership between K through 12 and community colleges. It's a partnership between businesses and community colleges and the community in general and community colleges. So with that in mind, we really have to think about all of the things that we do and of course, with technology changing so rapidly, how do we do those things? We teach so many different types of students from, as I said, uh, teenagers to returning students who are a little bit older than that, who have different learning styles, different expectations, and different motivations. And we do it around our district in, in myriad ways. And so it really is a fascinating time to be in higher education. And really, community colleges is where the action is. Then, of course, the added um, facet of the dialogue within the state about overhauling higher education and reviewing all of the things we do and how we administer those, coupled with the 40-40-20 plan, workforce development, really makes us the focal point of the higher education dialogue within the state. And it's really interesting as we start to navigate that and think about what a community college does and, and is in the 21st century, then we're looking 20 years out 
And so that's kind of where I'm trying to go with these conversations. And then it's easier for us to take that 20 year span and then look to see where five years fits into that, which helps us with our strategic plan. This is a time not to be incremental in the way that we think, but to be more visionary and innovative. So it really does implore you to be part of that discussion. And we talk about big, hairy, audacious goals. And, and we mean that. What can we do which is really bold and out there, but really advances the dial in a really significant way rather than just nudging it gently? We want to make some huge strides. That's part and parcel of setting the stage for today. I have some questions I want to ask of the panel. They're going to have, give me the answers that I expect or don't expect. Uh, and then I'm also hoping that you will have follow-up questions towards the end and, and engage us in a, in a dialogue about community college and community education. So with that, I guess one of the, the first things that um, is really important is workforce development. And, and one of the things that I've learned in the few months that I've been here is that there are jobs in Oregon and jobs that are going begging. And yet we're not able to fill those jobs because perhaps we don't necessarily have the, the match between workers with those skills and the jobs that are out there. And so one of the things that is intriguing to me is trying to get people who are involved in this at a table, sit down and talk about it, not just have one-on-one -on -one conversations in many different venues, but to get all of the people involved and, and talk about it and, and solve the problem. So one of the problems I see is that within the K through 12 system, we're not getting people into a pipeline, into a job down the road. And, and the businesses are perhaps not pulling as much as we're also not pushing as much into the, into the pipeline program. So, so maybe I'll start with, with Jeff and, and Andrew and, and ask a little bit about how do we work with businesses and K through 12 to, to get the pipeline filled from school to jobs in those areas where there are jobs and there's a need for jobs? That's a great question. I, one thing I want to say, I'm really excited about uh, being part of this dialogue, and I, and I think it needs to be a continuing dialogue. If, if, uh, if I, anything else is true, is that connection between what's going on here and business is absolutely critical. Um, it has been any uh, endeavor I've, I've been a part of in the past, whether at David Douglas um, or more recently, so please uh, continue to be part of this dialogue as we go forward, not a one not a one stop uh, conversation. So having said that, uh, let me bring you up to date a little bit. If you don't know what has happened at the state level, and uh, I'll go with the last thing you talked about, which was the uh, starting that pipeline, and uh, how do we get kids at an earlier age excited about a career? And I think. Part of that work is actually we need to do a better job clear back at middle school. That's the age at which kids are starting to explore. They're a little bit curious about uh, what they might do when they grow up. If they don't get excited at that point, that may be the point at which they start dropping out of high school. Uh, so we're, we're working on that. Uh, the one of the best things I think happened in the whole uh, session is we came up with a grant program, a revitalization of uh, shop programs. And being a former shop teacher, that was kind of near and dear to my heart. But we put in, a, it's a $10 million grant program. It's just a start. Um, and uh, I like the idea that it's a grant program. So we've had, uh, I think it's about 60 schools across the state have applied for grants. And those will be announced sometime in January. And they're anywhere from 50000 to $500,000 uh, grants. And I think that's so critical. And an essential part of those grant applications was to indicate their involvement with business. So it's not just some shop teacher going off and deciding they've got a great idea on what, what they should do. They're, it's really uh, getting the community involved in that. So I think it's a really smart way to do it. And there are probably opportunities for uh, many more people in business to become involved. Um, another plug I want to put in is for something called career technical student organizations. And I got half a million dollars for that. 
And these are programs, some of you might be familiar with Future Farmers of America, Skills USA, uh, HOSA, which is Health Occupations, and there's three others. Um, these are groups, and they're also a grant program, but they, spe they uh, help teachers teach uh, the skills they need, and but they're also a heavy leadership component. So that again, these are the things that get kids excited about going to school. And if you go to like a state competition, you see these kids that are uh, demonstrating their skills, it's a really amazing thing. So look for career technical student organizations at a high school near you. They actually also go into the colleges, some of the programs do. Um, so the, the grant program, both of those are grant based, and I like that funding mechanism. It uh, gives people a chance in the business community to be involved. So um, I'll stop there. I'm sure we'll come back. <laughs> well, um, <coughs> thank you, by the way, for inviting us and uh, coordinating this conversation because I think it's, it's, uh, it's well-timed and uh, absolutely necessary. Um, I guess uh, I would totally agree on the K through 12 end. Um, you know, re-emphasizing career and technical education, providing more opportunities to kids to, uh, you know, understand what's out in the labor market, what might be available in the future to them, uh, those kinds of exposure activities, hands-on <coughs> kinds of um, experiences, they really matter to young kids, I think, particularly. Um, my story is my son is in... Uh, is in sixth grade and he goes to, he went to Ainsworth and now he's in East Sylvan, which is considered very, very, you know, high end of the public school system, a important public district here. And one activity that he absolutely would point to as the best thing he's done is last year, the guy from Pink Martini, every year they do a salsa band. <laughs> and Yesterday, he was out and he's rattling the beat on the table, and he understands how to do every single part that was in that salsa band, <laughs> and still remembers it now, over a year later. And I mean, it was all about hands, it was all about that sort of experiential learning that is just, um, it's magical for young kids, and I think anything we can do to promote that in the K-12 structure is, is valuable. Uh, from our perspective, um, having worked with the colleges and, and um, you know, other providers in the community for a no number of years trying to engage with industry um, and do it in a way that really works for industry, and I guess that would be uh, just sort of my learning over time is that on the public side, I, I, we, we all want to, to get involved with industry and we, we all want to do and understand their needs, and we, we recognize, we know that we need to hear from them to be able to be effective on the back end. But our problem is, is um, we tend to do that in isolation. And ultimately, at least my experience has been, that doesn't work for industry. It's like, man, I can't take the noise, you know? I want to be helpful, but you have to do it in a way that works for industry. So. You know, I think moving forward where we see a lot of opportunity and a lot of um, places for additional collaboration is how do we engage industry to solve multiple uh, challenges and to understand them in a more systemic way, in a more convenient way that really does work for industry. And I think we've done some stuff, you know, working more broadly at a regional level. I mean, PCC's district is the side of Rhode Island, but the sort of labor shed is the sign of size of Rhode Island and Connecticut and maybe a portion of New Jersey. You know, it's a very large labor shed that employers draw from. So figuring out how do we, you know, work together to conveniently engage employers and have them at the table at a regular basis, I think is a is a big opportunity for us moving forward. Mm -hmm. So so let me th to add to that, you know, we have about 90,000 people that we educate on an annual basis here, and, and yet, and, and this is for you, Elizabeth, so, um, so we're not educating all of the people who obviously the, the workforce needs, and so um, part of the discussion that, that I hear is that you know, people are not going into the pipeline, or, or if they are, then they don't have the specific skills that they needed to be immediately effective, and so 
it's a trade-off in some ways between the classroom environment uh, and, as Andrew says, the, the experiential side, the, the practical side of things. So how do we hear from businesses about their needs in terms of specific training or specific skills, and, and how do we then balance that uh, sort of hands-on experience with the classroom environment, in essence? So for, first, again, I would say, as Andrew did, thanks for inviting me, but I'll tell you, I'm really grateful to Jessica because when she introduced me, she didn't give my age like she did with Chris. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> really grateful about that. <laughs> I thought, wow. <laughs> so, um, so how do we I engage more with industry was the foundational question, I guess, and then how do you balance what you hear? Um, so uh, one, I think this kind of forum is one way to have a conversation and to exchange. But you know, as I look out, I know Charlie and I have, have been involved in community things for a long time. But you know, it's, it's that reaching out, I think, that makes a difference. But it's also not just reaching out, but it's how do you get them involved? I mean, I think of some of the work that we've been able to do and just having the conversations. Because it's not a one-way piece about hearing from the industry. I, I just think of how much I've learned over the years. Uh, and I guess I've been involved with PCC things. I think Bonnie and I were talking about it earlier for you know, 15 or 16 years probably now. And I, I, I wish I had listened better a number of years ago. You know, I wish I had maybe listen more instead of asked, you know, because I think it's absolutely a two-way street. I think we're doing some work with Susan and her group now, and, and I think about what we're learning in that. So we don't have all the answers. I think um, sometimes we recognize, at least in industry, I think we recognize our own needs, but we don't always know how to answer them. But what I do know is that, and, and having worked with Andrew a fair amount over the years, it really is about the collaboration piece. Because none of us can do it by ourselves anymore. It's gotten so complicated. And so uh, maybe then from the industry side, it's, we don't, maybe it is about looking for that answer and a path to get there, because otherwise it just gets confusing. Like you want to get help, but you don't know where to go. So if you're fortunate and you have the relationships or the connections, then you go after it. But, but maybe, maybe one of the big, hairy, audacious goals is how do you get that involvement from people? And, and not that that's an easy challenge, but you know, how do you build those relationships over time? How do you get people involved so that they feel comfortable asking, you know, and and have have a place to go? Yeah, I, I think it's just really important that the, the dialogue is, is really important, uh, and of course, we'll all be energized from the discussion today. But it goes beyond that. It's like. We can talk, but let's actually get things done. And so at some point, we have to come up with a plan and then make sure that we enact that plan and, and have, as, as we would call, sort of measurables or assessment of how well we're meeting those things, rather than just having a piece of paper that sits in my desk gathering dust and, you know, and a, and a photo opportunity, which really is, is immaterial. It's the end product that's the most important thing. You know, when I think about working with industry, I, I don't. Um, well, so from the inside out perspective, uh, of course, I came from the world of education. So then I moved from there into industry. And so I had a little bit of the, I can do it by myself <laughs> attitude. You know? And I'm not so sure that was the right attitude to have because um, you know, I did do it by myself, but I'm not so sure that that was very sustainable. You know? And so I think it's what can we do that helps it also be sustainable? It can't be a one-off anymore for us. How do, how do we embed something in our system so that once we get the help, we then now, inside an industry, own it? And then how do we make it work? How do we, um, and that, I suppose that's a piece about collaboration, but it's about each of us doing what's really good. Help me develop it, help my, you know, us get our feet on the ground, and then we, we can run with it. We can check in with, but we want to run with it. Mm -hmm. Great, so, so Heather, let me ask you this question. Um, Healthcare is going to be a huge uh, burgeoning field in terms of jobs. And, and if you think of it as an industry, it, it, there's a lot of potential out there. And, and one of the things that we are always mindful of is not training somebody for a job for tomorrow, but also a job five years from now. And so, you know, so, so who would have thought you know, a year ago that web programming would be a huge part of the Affordable Care Act? And, 
And now that job has gone away, apparently. <laughs> so, um, but what, because we're having some really exciting discussions right now on our campus about allied health programs and, and how we sort of position ourselves for you know, the 21st century, the next 20 years or so. So how do you help us, in essence, get a, a much greater clarity of vision looking at, at that particular industry looking in the future? Fabulous question, and something that healthcare has been, I won't say struggling with, but grappling with for the last two or three years. This is an exciting time in healthcare. It's a time of change. This is something that we're going to be talking about to our grandchildren. I was there during that change, during that huge climate change, culture change. And I think you're right when you're saying the web piece. The, one of the things that we've seen, Providence recently has undergone um, a, a change in documentation to meet the government requirements, the, the carrot and the stick from the government. It's been fabulous. The people that we've needed to not only operationalize this, but to maintain it, the at-the-elbow support for the clinician, somebody who can say, hey, doctor, let me show you how to do this really fast and easy so the physician can get the right product out, make the right orders so the nurse, the, the pharmacist can follow it. So we're seeing a lot of that at the elbow support, but we're seeing a lot of need for optimization. So we've got just the beginnings of this integrated medical record. We need a medical record that's smart, that does things for us. So it's a little morbid, but... Um, had loved one who was deceased. Shortly thereafter, we were getting notifications of that loved one's next doctor's appointment. That was, was hurtful, and I know that it was not intentional, but because we've automated the system so much, now it's the computer generating things. Well, the computer needs to be smart enough to then go in and say that if a patient is deceased, that all further communication will be terminated. So there's a huge piece of optimization. So there's more than, than I can even fathom, not just the at-the-elbow support, but making more robust, smarter systems. So IT is a huge need in, in the healthcare reform. The other thing, we're changing from this fee-for-service-based mentality to how do we keep people healthy in the first place? How do we keep them from needing to come into the hospital? How do we keep them healthy? How do we identify when something's going wrong before something bad happens? And that whole case management piece, both in the inpatient facility and outpatient facilities. So in the community setting, how do we get out there and identify when people are having troubles with their medications or when they're having troubles just getting around? So case management. And, and that's something that I could certainly see CLIMB helping with. We have a lot of practitioners. We've got nurses. We've got social workers who have the skill set, but they don't have that advanced knowledge of how do you then make these connections between community services and the patient's needs. So I absolutely can see that growth in certifications of you get professionals in who have now advanced roles. And then the other piece, if we look at what we see from <coughs> healthcare reform, we see that keeping people in their homes is a good idea. And how do we get inexpensive assistance, maybe not medical? But those elderly patients who have 26 medications and doctor's appointments and everything else that needs coordinated, they need some sort of guidance on how to navigate that system. And so certification for those neighborhood individuals who aren't healthcare related but are going to help keep our patients healthy mm -hmm. is, is another piece. So I see this workforce development as being a huge component of what the community college can offer our industry. Uh, that's great, and it, it sort of leads me into the question for, for Chris, in essence, which is, um, you know, we offer so many things, yet we're not necessarily um, out there letting people know all of the things that we offer. So, you know, and you are in essence our, one of our shining stars in terms of an example of coming to us and using small business development resources to, to help you 
know, realize the, the potential that you see in, in your uh, industry. So, so what can we do better to, to advertise all of the services that we provide? And, and are we able to better customize for each individual in, in ways that would certainly help businesses in general? Well, um, I guess we, I, we've worked with a lot of other organizations within Portland and nobody really referred us directly to the SBDC and we just kind of needed help and didn't have the funding to be able to find somebody to, to be able to come in and help us. And so just out of need, we, with research, found the SBDC. But I can't imagine where we would be now if we could have got that foundation in the very beginning. Um, but so, I mean, I don't know the best way to get the word out more, but I know it's definitely needed and it'll definitely help the create a stronger foundation for a lot of other smaller businesses to grow. Um, but um, as far as, you know, just partnering up with some of the other organizations too, I, we've worked with Mercy Corps, but they never referred us over to here, and um, I think that could really be beneficial. And then just maintaining the, the high quality that we have right now with all the advisors, I think is really key. Um, you know, the, the capital access team was, was a very crucial part to Mudshark's success in getting that loan, and I know we would not be here today if it was not for, for those guys, Rick and Noah, um, really educated me on, on how to you know, go to banks and, and get a loan, and up until that point, I mean, we had no idea how to get funding, and funding being the crucial part to growing the business, so I mean, whatever we can do to maintain that, and and grow up more is, is definitely needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think um, though building on that, I think um, it's, it's some of those skills that, uh, that we have that need to be um, advanced, which are not just the technical skills, but also the business skills, so in some ways. So, uh, so Andrew, in, in some sense, can we um, think about how do we develop these soft skills in a curriculum that really, um, gives people not just the technical skills, but the skills to be successful no matter what changes happen down the road that people then can adapt to those things. Yeah, the <coughs> I mean, you hear this, I, you know, they said 20 years in my thing, it's probably a little longer, Elizabeth, on the workforce development front, but you know, from day one, it's always about those uh, soft skills, which are now being referred to as essential skills, you know, can you communicate with your coworkers? Can you show up on time? Um, increasingly, you know, you hear conversations about drug use and sort of, and uh, you know, I, if you guys have a curriculum or <laughs> know of one that, re that really works, uh, but I think there's an enormous opportunity there. And um, I think uh, there's opportunity in that um, from a couple uh, respects, a it's it's a clear need on the employer front, and and b um, trying to figure out who is prepared for work and prepared to learn on the job is really uh, really essential. I mean, I, I I haven't heard many employers, especially today, you know, with evolving technology and new equipment, very expensive equipment. Um, most employers are very uh, eager and frankly, um, you know, uh, require their own on-the-job training for employees where they get frustrated or they're not as well equipped is really on the soft skill and on just those sort of basic academics. Uh, people have to be prepared to learn and prepared to succeed on the team and I think employers get frustrated if they have to go back and and redo what they expect out of a public system. Um, you know, I think the state's focus on the National Career Readiness Certificate is a step in the right direction around um, sort of uh, documenting those basic academic skills. I think there is a need for us to find some other mechanism to couple those soft skills with that NCRC as a mechanism to be able to say, these workers are qualified for these kinds of things. And frankly, you know, probably some combination of 
engagement in looking at, you know, what better place to learn good workplace skills than on a job. So internships, um, really digging into the unemployment insurance roles. There's lots of opportunity there. Lots of unemployed Oregonians in our region. And I think this has been part of the, the budding partnership that we've seen in WorkSource where you have, you know, at any time 50 plus thousand unemployed workers. But the point is these guys actually have a work history and then sort of looking at that and better understanding where they are I think is uh, provides a lot of opportunity on the educational front, not only to add those soft skills, but then also to add some academic work as well. Mm -hmm. So Elizabeth, do you want to uh, chime in on that? Yeah, I'd <coughs> like to chime in on that one. Um, but uh, it's it's not about the essential skills, or the people skills being separate from the work that you do. I think we look at this from different places, but you know, if, if people are coming to class, they need to show up on time. People who you know aren't turning in their assignments, they don't pass their class. You know, um, you get people in from the industry to come in and say, "Look, showing up on time is important, and you can't be on drugs. It doesn't work that way. Somebody's life depends on you being okay." So I, I think setting the standards right from the beginning, and not separating them out, like, "Okay, you need to learn this technical skill, and then you need to learn how to be a decent human being." No, they come hand in hand. You know, and I think the ex about expectations. So. You know, is there a way you can assess that? You know, um, if somebody on my team doesn't show up for work on a number of uh, any length of time, you know, they're due for a pretty good conversation. It doesn't work that way. So mm -hmm. that's really practical, but you know, <laughs> I don't know that you separate it out. You need to drive it. Yeah. I think with intention you need to drive it. So maybe in, in math class you talk about showing up on time. In, you know, science class, you talk about showing up on time. Industrial arts class, you talk about showing up on time and being responsible. I mean, you hear that message enough times, you know, it's, it's pretty clear. But I, I think it sort of ties into the, the idea, and you know, of course we all remember when we were of that age that, you know, it was uphill to school and, and back from school is also uphill and there was three inches of snow and we made it in our bare feet. And, and, <laughs> and so we're expecting students to have that same sort of approach in essence. But I think you know, the changing times, students are, think differently these days, but I think we also have to think differently how we educate them. So it, it's not perhaps the, the 19th century model of the chalkboard and, and 300 people sitting in a room, but there are ways, I think, for us to think a bit about teaching soft skills in an infused environment where we're teaching not just the technical skills, but also the people skills. Uh, and so I think that's a, an important thing. So Jeff, maybe you want to think a little bit about how we sort of uh, train people to be productive as well as adaptive. I love this. This is, this is probably why I really like being a shop teacher. <laughs> well, you know, you think about it. It's, it's, a, it's the hands-on. It's the, it's the planning. It's the communications. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, you can see whether you, you got something done or not. So that's, I think that any kind of a project-based learning uh, where it's a team approach, and maybe it's a simulation of a small manufacturing uh, project, and, and you do all your design work, you, you plan out the materials, you operate the equipment. You have to do a lot of planning, organizing, communications. Doesn't that sound like a lot, a lot like what you do in business? I mean, so um, that's what a lot of high schools do now. And uh, we want to do more of that. So if I sound like, a, you know, maybe I only have one song here today, um, it is really, uh, there are a lot of good things going on about practical education, project-based education. So we have a, those things are happening. Uh, we just need to do more of it, and we need to make sure that we help the educators keep focused. There always seems to be a little bit of a tension between educators and business. And that's just, you know, I've been on both sides. And so um, I think as educators, we need to be more welcoming. And then I, I would hope that we figure out how to, you know, really have good communications together so so to the last question before we open it up to, to everybody else in uh, for, uh, for Heather and for Chris in a sense of re-education or coming back to to either update skills to gain new skills or you know I always make the argument that you know if you're a, an engineer and you're a really good engineer then through some fault that you had in a previous life you get promoted into management which 
may not match with your engineering skills. So how, do, in essence, do you come back and get those skills? So, so what, how do we meet those needs also and, uh, in essence, customize it for the person? So Heather, do you want to start with that one? Well, and again, I have the same re drum that I'm repeating. With the changes in healthcare, we've got to cut out the fat. We know there's, there's some extra in there. We've got to get it out. We've got to have more quality. And that means we're not going to have the same resources that we had before. So if the state requires that in order to have a behavioral health hold room, you need to have preventive management and then of assaultive behavior, and you need to have an annual eight hours of education to ensure you can help keep people from getting to that violent place in the first in the first place. And then if they are there, how do you de-escalate them and how do you safely respond? So eight hours a day for every individual that works with this, this is every ER, every behavioral health, every security guard, that's a huge time commitment for both training and for the staff. So I think about all the things that are homegrown currently. Um, we currently use CLIMB for ACLS, or Advanced Cardiac Life Support. We use it for our credentialing for our emergency room nurses. We're going to need more of that as we become leaner and leaner. So I definitely see that piece. And then, again, as we are expanding our roles, we have a lot of nurses who are very interested in computers. And they tend to gravitate to informatics. Well, I love computers. I'm a nurse. But I don't know anything about informatics. How do I get there? So again, it's some of the computer pieces. It's the case management pieces. It's, it's maybe even how do you learn to coordinate. So I think keeping your pulse, um, keeping the pulse of where healthcare, where any industry is going and Sometimes it's an active push. What can I do for you? I had a conversation with Sheila um, a week ago, and there were a few things that are the flavor of the week, the month, the year, that are very, very much alive in my world, and I forget to share them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so some sort of regular touch, you know, what are you doing? What's keeping you up at night? What's, what's hard for you? What can we do to help out? Mm -hmm. And I think in, in higher ed, we're we're really good at starting new things, but we're not so good at stopping doing things. Uh, and we can go into that for hours, I'm sure. <laughs> but, but I think you're right. And sort of what new things do we need to do and, and, and what's now is passe or has been replaced by something else is also important, just as important, frankly. But, but Chris, so tell us a little bit about you know, in the future and retraining and, and new sort of skill sets and things like that. What, how do we learn about those? and, and, and help people to, to continue to flourish? You know. Well, where Mudshark is at right now, we're trying to implement our middle management and be as lean as possible. So you know, we're looking for people with as many skills um, in a variety of different areas, whether it's just accounting, marketing, um, management, and then also you know, manufacturing skills. So you know, computer education being a big thing, and being able to, I guess, if we can get somebody who has a variety of skills, we can train them in the ceramic aspect of it. But um, I guess offering um, programs that, that they where they could learn accounting but not have to be an accountant, or um, some of these broader skills, so that you know they have a wider range, and then we can hone in on on what they're good at. But really, just trying to find somebody who has as many skills as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. So questions from, from everybody in the audience. What, uh, what's on your mind? What would you like to ask uh, any one of us or all of us collectively? So, uh, uh, yeah. I'll throw this out. Uh, again, I'm, we're a small manufacturer like Chris. And so there's a number of different things and we're in manufacturing. And anybody in manufacturing here has the reality that whether it be ESCO, Bud Shark, or Sunset Manufacturing, we're a variable cost business. It's materials and it's a labor. And we have to match those to the streams of revenue that we have available. So we're going to be fickle. Over the years, we're going to be in increases and decreases. As an employer, what we're looking for is an ability to have a resource pool where we know what their skills and certifications are as a supply base. But on a community side, we want to be able to, if we release workers, we also want to be able to have them 
be available to the community so the community knows. So back to the models and so forth. To me, it sounds like a community college needs to be, in a sense, biting off smaller pieces <coughs> that are identifiable with certifications that are transferable across industries. There's no reason, for instance, Chris just mentioned a whole set of skills. There's no reason that I could, you couldn't take an entry-level machinist in my company and have them successful in Chris's line if they know process, safety, so on and so forth. And I think that's our collective um, responsibility, really, to the labor pool within this marketplace. And if we can provide that, that will attract businesses into Oregon. <laughs> but it has to be identified. It has to be certifiable. And the individual has to take responsibility for carrying that. To the okay. Anybody want to comment on that? Or Elizabeth? Um, I, I do want to support what Charlie's saying, because I, I think that the, the community college level, I mean, uh, the community colleges are so vital to our community. But it's because they play such a broad role, which I also think is probably the challenge. But from a, from, um, so from the industry perspective, I, I think it is really about um, the certification piece, I think is really helpful for us. So we're working on that. We're trying to get smarter in our community. You know, Jesse from WSI is helping us. We're trying to get smarter in that. So I think that's one piece of it. I think another piece from the industry is, as much as, as we try to build identity the, um, of our own, and then I say this out loud, you're going to go, well, we're working hard to be a community of PCC. But when you get out in the world, it's community college. It's not Portland Community College or Mount Hood Community College or Clackamas Community College. It is the community college system. So we, so we need the consistency between those systems so what that looks like, you know, becomes important to us as, as an industry as well. Oh, they came out of our community college system. That's really important. We know the quality of it as well. And as long as I have the mic, I'm going to do two more hurry out issues to goals. But when I think it's from a family perspective, you know, school is getting so incredibly expensive for your colleges. How do people send kids to school anymore? So I think they look to the community college for... A the cost that's not so exorbitant, a place to get, th to put some roots down in education so that they maybe would go someplace further, but they also want it really high quality. So from family, I think it's cost and quality. From industry, I think it's the certification, and I think it's the consistency. And then, uh, unfortunately, because I'm way more older than Chris, I think there's another place for a big, hairy, audacious goal. And I lived in Japan for a couple years, and I'm awed by what they did with their community about the commitment to education and continuous learning. So how could we do a marketing around, look, folks, don't just be sitting around anymore. You know, get out there, do something. I don't care if it's teaching the classes, but be part of them. Do this, do that, do this. So that we kind of inspire this generation, because people are retiring now when you know, in the past, they didn't have that much longer to live. Now you got a whole bunch of people who are going to be living another 30, 40, 50 years when they retire. So let's give them something good to do and be part of that education piece. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. We'll add to that. Wow. That's, that's, uh, that's a lot to follow up on. I think <laughs> part of a... Uh, well, because y you said what I was thinking as well, which is... Um, Community colleges should be a place that people aspire to go to. Whether you are going there for that two-year degree, whether you want a certificate, whether you need to be retrained, and I and I think the marketing of community colleges is is part of it. We need to uh, help people understand um, this is a very special place. And I'm I got to tell you, I'm a real fan of community colleges. I have been a long time, and uh, and I've gone there for when I needed an accounting class. When I needed a, back in the olden days, a television repair class, if you can imagine. Nobody repairs those anymore, by the way. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, so we look at community college through different lenses, depending on what your need is at that time. But in all times, we need to market it better so people realize this is a golden opportunity, no matter what your needs. And uh, I just want to say one thing we haven't really touched on a little bit, but I'm really trying to figure out how do I help East Portland grow economically? And how do we, and I think the answer, part of it, is here 
through the Small Business Development Center. We need to uh, help those small businesses that uh, populate East Portland, need to help them understand what resources, what fabulous resources they have here. And uh, so how do we connect the small businesses and climb center activities and so forth? Because I don't think people know enough about what the opportunities are. So I think there's a role for some marketing. I did see the really big bus on the PCC campus the other day with uh, signs on it. I forget what it said, but it was impressive. Uh, <laughs> but it was, you know, we need to do more of that. We need to do more outreach. It was a big bus. Uh, <laughs> oh. But um, anyway, we've, we've got an opportunity here. I don't, you know, I disagree a little bit. You said we've been doing this stuff for 50 years. I don't think, w I'm personally, I don't think we need to change that much. I'm not looking for a big breakthrough. I think community colleges have this very broad uh, role, and we just need to be sure that we're flexible, we're nimble. Notice how I'm throwing in the we here, and I hope you all are too. Um, so just just keep doing it and do it smarter, better. Great. Other questions? Yeah, the lady there in the middle. And I actually teach from time to time for the climate One of the uh, so many things are just bubbling in my brain. With regard to the medical industry, I also work with medical professionals, including my work. And the area of medical practice and clinic clinical management is going to be one of the fastest growing careers as that industry changes. And there are not enough people doing clinical, medical office, and hospital management to fill that gap. And I think there's a great place for community college to begin <coughs> filling that pipeline. You're going to need some kind of MBA at the very top, top level. But there's a, a lot of jobs that are going to get created a lot of services that used to get done in the hospital and are currently getting done in the hospital won't be done there. And medical practices, medical clinics, other medical providers will need those management people, those office operations type of people. So that's one thing. Um, I'd love to hear people say, oh, we should get the word out. Oh, we have affordable education. But the elephant in the room next to the big, hairy, audacious goal is how do we fund it? Mm -hmm. And with our state legislature consistently defunding public education, when I started out in the community college system, I was in California, and it was long enough ago that it cost $50 a semester plus your book. Mm -hmm. And we had to work to get people to come to the community college when it costs that. Mm -hmm. Now the tuition is way more. It really should be less than it is. But you need money to operate all these programs. Uh, back then, as now, community college was not perceived as a cool place to go after high school. That's the marketing message that has to shift. When people understand that instead of paying 280 or more per credit, what they, the value they can get and the quality of education they can get in the community college, that's the <coughs> message that's going to resonate that will bring the students that we need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we, I think over 50 years we've educated about 1.2 million people. So um, it's amazing to, to think of that statistic. and. We did a survey last year which showed that roughly 70% of the households in our districts have one or more family members who've attended PCC or are connected to PCC. So, so we're out there and, and yet there's still more that we could do. And, and I think and maybe um, Heather, you can follow up a little bit about the comment about um, healthcare management, if you will, and, and where Absolutely. you see that. Absolutely, and I'm glad you said that. I 100% agree. We do have a lot of managers who are of retirement age. And we don't have a lot of people in the pipeline who think working 12 hours a day um, is a, a good idea. Mm -hmm. So when you think about <laughs> the, the younger pot generation is looking going, why would you do that job? 
So we need to make it more approachable. But there is also a huge skill set with communication, with staffing, with how do you hire and fire somebody? How do you coach and counsel somebody? So absolutely, that was part of your question earlier that I didn't address. And I'm glad you mentioned it, because it is a huge piece that we need to be able to grow our leadership. Mm -hmm. Jeff, did you want to add to that? Just brief, brief comment on the funding because um, <laughs> really, I no no you're absolutely right and and uh, keep in mind I've only been in office a year so it's not all my uh, it's not all my fault uh, but we uh, I think the ask this year for the 17 community colleges was five and five hundred twenty five million uh, with considerable effort it was raised to four eighty. 465, I'll quibble over that 15 million, but uh, so it's a, yes, and, and it was probably a conservative ask at, at that amount, so we've got a long ways to go, and it, let me go back to K-12 just a second. We were really proud because we raised funding on K-12 education by a billion dollars. The uh, quality education model just came out and, and indicated we're still shy about two billion. Uh, we are just, we've got to do something about revenue in the state, and I hope that that's an emphasis in the 2015 session, because, uh, you know, it's not like uh, we're just stingy down there, it's, there's a lot of needs, so. Yeah, and, and I think, just to follow up, we've, we've talked a lot about money, and we're all, you know, over the past five years, ending in 11-12, uh, we grew 40% in five years, and our budget went down. Um, so there's something not quite right with that model. You don't have to be a nuclear physicist to figure that out. <laughs> but, uh, but the other side of it is, and, and I believe this firmly, that you know, we, we're users of taxpayers' money, and so we should be held accountable. So how do we, in essence, have a dialogue, and we're starting to do this amongst the, the community college presidents, about how do we measure our effectiveness in, in using taxpayers' money and all of those things. And, it's not just give us more money because trust us, we'll be fine with that. It's like, well, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to be measured. So you know that you're going to get value for that. So it's really important for that. But I, I just want to add somebody else having had a question over here. Yes. Bob Zaroski, I've been uh, about 30 years in higher ed in a variety of different schools. So I'd like to address it not just from community college, but higher ed. And I think this is the group that could really make a difference because we have higher ed, we have business. And I think what's needed is people sending a consistent message because I noticed there's a difference between community colleges that want to fill their classes, the students who are chasing a degree, not the education, and business and industry who wants the knowledge base to be brought back. And so if we can send a consistent message to our students so they know that it's the education that's important to all of us. I listened to some of the Oh, Intel, for example, and my my son went through Intel. They gave him a forty thousand dollar check, put it aside for his master's in uh, electrical engineering. But they put a condition: one class only per term, and they monitored it. He was expected to come back and train other people on what he learned. <coughs> so not only did he learn in class in short term, but he had to digest this material and hold to long-term memory. And I think as business and industry leaders, if we send this kind of message, the students will begin to hear this. Mm -hmm. I just listened to a group of students last night <coughs> making a presentation talking about how stressful it was to work full-time and go to school full-time. Yeah. It is. Their expectation was that they've heard from other students and even faculty members, is it one hour in class and one hour homework? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For those of you that have been around as long as I have, it used to be on a ratio of one to three, mm -hmm. or four in graduate study. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, this is what's changed. And the students aren't greedy, but they're paying a lot of money for their education, and they're displaced workers, and they need to get back into the workforce as quick as possible. But we still need to maintain the quality of education. Mm -hmm. So, so, so let me ask the question then, do we think that businesses, as, we, as much as we talk about community college funding, do we think businesses are investing as much as they should or could do 
in educating their workforce. Andrew, why don't you take that <laughs> one? <laughs> of course they are. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, I think every business uh, knows that they have to invest in their workforce and, uh, in order to maintain their competitiveness and enhance their growth. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I mean, the statistics are somewhere about four to one for every public dollar invested. There's a four dollar contribution on the training side by by the private side, and I I think that's true. And I think it's particularly true in industries that are experiencing rapid change, especially related to technology, manufacturing, healthcare. Um, you can't compete in today's economy if you don't have a qualified workforce uh, and you don't use the most sophisticated equipment. Um, that's my guess. And my guess is you probably experienced a lot of rapid growth because hey, you've got a bunch of smart people, but you're using good equipment, good process, and all that stuff. And you need that, you, 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 uh, a business needs that, and they know it. Um, you know, that's not to say that uh, there doesn't need to be a partnership there. And again, I think uh, our, um, on the K through 12 side, I think there's a lot of work to be done to raise the bar and uh, improve the quality of uh, kids that are coming out of that system, not just for their preparation for post-secondary, but their preparation for work. Uh, and I mean, I think I totally agree uh, with Elizabeth. Our challenge on the workforce front, and I think even on the college front, is you're, you're sitting there with an adult worker and somehow we're trying to certify those skills and soft skills are a part of them. But if we had our brothers, they would be drilled in and incorporated all across the line from day one as you know, just an expectation of being a good citizen as well as a good student. Hmm. So I do think industry, long and short, is spending the money. It's tough to have them spend the money outside of, of their company. We've tried to do a lot of <coughs> industry work I think um, you know it's about delivery now, and I think the more that we can demonstrate uh, as a partnership, as a workforce partnership, that um, we're producing more qualified people, that those skills are um, validated and they're meaningful to the industry, I think you may see uh, a potential rise for different kinds of investment from industry, but I think the, the proof is in the pudding for them and we need to deliver. Yeah, and, and I think delivery is a really important part because, you know, it, 20 years ago we were all concerned about training our work, our workers and said, so, well, we can't, s we don't have time to send them to a two o'clock accounting class. And now we have ways of, in essence, making a 24-hour uh, accessibility to some of those things. So I think those are important. And, and I guess yeah. the other thing is just the, the customization, so making sure that we're developing those exact, precise skills that people need. And I think we're able to do those now if we're put our minds to it. So. Yeah, and I think uh, just quickly, you know, the whole online learning phenomenon and where that's headed, I was actually in Washington, D.C. a couple uh, months ago, and there was a program, the first accredited, fully accredited AA degree in business administration that's fully competency-based, 120 separate competencies delivered online. And the total cost was $2,500 a year. Mm -hmm. And the reality is for an adult worker, you could go in and you'd probably master 60 to 80% of those competencies right out of the bat. So the cost automatically goes straight down. And that's going to have uh, a significant transformational impact on our delivery models. And I think that's a challenge but an opportunity as well for the educational enterprises. How do we take advantage of these new tools and integrate them as effectively as possible um, to your own models of delivery? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Elizabeth. I was going to respond to the question about do industries do enough um, of training. So, um, uh, or development is probably a better word, but um, I would, and I live in a world, of course it's in my department, so of course I want to say it's right, but um, we here in Portland did about 66,000 hours of training last year, and we have a campus of about 1,000 employees here in Portland. Um, we have sent 
people to get their master's degree in areas we don't know about. For example, robotics is, is newer to us. So, um, and I just noticed I'm, I have a duck pen in my hand, so don't tell my husband he came from Corvallis. Um, so, <laughs> um, but he had, but so we as a business partnered with Oregon State where we're sending these you know, young folks to get their master's degree in robotics, and because they didn't have the equipment to do it, so ESCO also bought the equipment so that, that when they practiced it, they were practicing and working on the equipment they had. So that's an amazing partnership for that school and for ESCO because we both win. Um, we have a strong commitment to developing our people, and we stay on it, we track it, we work it, we expect it, we you know, provide it. We, 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 um, and I think one of the highest compliments to us in our work one time was um, our CEO, then Steve Pratt, was in the room and he said um, to a group who had just done a presentation, because we really try to keep our senior leaders involved in the work that people do. It's been key to our success. So people know what's going on. It's not separate. So they're giving a report out on what they had learned. And, and Steve said, was so impressed by what they had done. He said, you must have just had some really good training. You know how you step back and your mind plays the scenario out for you? The scenario that played out for me was great. Now these people are going to know exactly how much good we did for them. They're going to talk about how good the training department is and the development department. I mean, this was our chance to shine from behind the scene, right? And the words that came out of that guy's mouth was, because he's a shop worker. I mean, we're a steel company, right? Great big guy stands up and he goes, we didn't have any training. <laughs> and then, oh my god, we've been at this for months. And I realized he never separated it from his work. I thought, wow. That was the highest compliment we could have ever gotten. So what's that challenge about making it hands-on enough that it's not separated from work? It's not out, oh, I'm going to take a class at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. No, this is what we do, and this is how we do it. That's the mindset that, that I think we need f from the industry side. I don't know, Heather, if you want to. I want to talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a point that I didn't address that earlier that really resonated with me, and that is making education cool. And I think about our, our students now, and we know if we look at the generational models that these are people that were never held behind, and they have phenomenal self-esteem. These were people who weren't selected away from the dodgeball team. Everybody got on. <laughs> so. What I see, and I see this in my children, is they're not looking for a job. They're looking for a position. And if we can make it cool. I went to a community college as a master's prepared nurse and took a welding class, and it was awesome. I'm not willing to give up my career, but if I did have to lose it, I'd go back to welding because it was a lot of fun. It was cool. You get to make things. And I, I like that piece. I think we need to really tailor the push to the personality that's out there now. They want something cool. They've got really high self-esteem. They deserve a position. But if we tell them how cool these things are, and that becomes part of, of, where, of just the, their mindset, I think that would really help with, with expanding programs. So I know it was a different topic, but I just, it, I've just been sitting here thinking, if we could just make it cool, if we could just make it a position, if we could make vocations as awesome as they are, they were very needed. I but think I, it would yeah. be a bit. But it goes back to the idea that you know when we talk about manufacturing or welding or something that we have this idea that it's something that my dad did 50 years ago and it's totally different now. And so part of it is just educating people about how cool it is to go into some of these industries and you know you get to play with a a really expensive CNC machine and you know you're not lying on the floor in a pool of oil it's something else and <laughs> and and that sort of draws people in in essence so it's the same thing so last question and I think there's a gentleman he had his hand up really early on so yeah yeah uh, <clears throat> I've spent my pretty much life in trades and industry one way or another and started working at 13 perhaps many of you did that as well uh, for a private small business I stayed with it for six years by the time I was out of high school, I was having an interview with the vice president of a company in Los Angeles, 
become a sales rep, and he said I didn't have enough, we'll say, credibility because of my age, which is fine, I understood. But so my point is, is that if I could have the can of spray paint and do it on the side of the building here, I would say let's enable 13-year-old work permits. <laughs> Who wants to take that one? <laughs> I'm passing. I work for steel that's poured at 2,800 degrees. So. <laughs> But I think part of the, the issue is um, what we talked about in, in reaching down into the K through 12 to, to give people the opportunity to understand what it is to go into a certain industry. So it may not be a work permit per se, but it's a work experience. And, and bringing businesses and, and industry into the schools to explain exactly what it's like or to take a group of students to somewhere uh, to their shop and, and say, this is what it's like to be a machinist these days. Or isn't it cool you're going to be a welder and this is this huge thing that you're working on. It's not some bench thing that, uh, you know, that you would know well in terms of the shop class. It's, it's making it relevant. And it, in a sense, the way that I see it is um, we've got to find a way to add relevance to some of the things that perhaps uh, are not directly uh, uh, associated with something. So for example, if I know how cool it is to be an engineer, then I understand why I need to study math and why physics is important. And if I don't understand that, then why am I taking this math class? It doesn't have the same motivation for me. So I think that's part of the, the issue. Does anybody else want to chime in on that? No, nope, only one per person, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I think we have time for Yes, sorry. Hi. Uh, yeah, I just I want to speak from my experience uh, coming out of high school. I was really bored in high school. And I was really excited about going to college. And it was a community college. And I thought, OK, now I can go and like, really learn what I want to learn and how I want to learn it. And when I first went in, uh, you know, they were like stirring me this way and that way and you know, taking all these required courses. And, it just seemed a lot like high school. And was, you know. So I ended up kind of dropping the program, but auditing classes, uh, which was OK at that time. Uh, I have since gone back to school officially and um, graduated. I have a BA and a master's to Merrillhurst. But I got that with the help of going to PCC for all my general ed classes. I couldn't, you know. I couldn't have afforded, I couldn't really afford it anyway, but <laughs> I could have afforded it even less if I hadn't, uh, if I didn't do the PCC part of it. Um, so there's that piece, and but also I am a career musician, and I'm self-employed, and a lot of my business um, just help and things that I've, I've learned a lot through taking community ed classes at PCC. And now I'm a teacher through the community ed program. And mm -hmm. what I would like to see is a couple things. One is that uh, people have a chance of taking community ed classes for credit um, if, if there's something that would work uh, towards like their community, towards their uh, general ed uh, things, or also an apprenticeship for credit program. And I don't know if there is something like that. I haven't checked. But, yeah. but those are just a couple of things. And, and it kind of goes back to the idea of um, the, the curriculum. And the, you know, we have a lot of things we have to fit into the, the credits that comprise a two-year degree, in essence. And, and yet, there's more and more things that we need to, to teach people. And, and it starts to burst at the seams in some ways. So it's like, so what do we stop teaching, or what do we try to merge in some ways? What's important? What's no longer relevant? So those things are, are really important. And so we've talked a lot about apprenticeships and internships as being a vital part of the training process. Uh, but it becomes increasingly difficult to, to do all of those things. Uh, but we do need to think about how we're more creative and preparing the workforce, in essence, 
not just with the classroom, but also the, the hands-on experience. So I don't know. Um, anybody else? Final comments, thoughts? So making things cool. I sponsor teachers and field trips with elementary school teachers and federal and schools. And we have sent kids out to the bridge tour to France Bakery and Esco would be a great place that big manufacturing. But the kids go in there and they think it's cool. And then they go back and they talk to the teacher and say, I want to do that. And the teacher says, okay, we need to do math and <coughs> science, and we need to start in fourth grade pointing these kids at things that are cool so they know why they're in school. <laughs> then they're motivated, and they're passing classes, and they have a focus on that future instead of just going, what is this point? I don't want to go. <laughs> and, and get that light in those kids. So... My call would be to the bigger companies and the manufacturers. And ESCO is to sponsor those field trips because kids don't take them anymore. Yep. No, I'm sorry, that's what I like to go to school. They behave, they get excited, they want to go to the next field trip. So we are not just sending them to the zoo, we're sending them also to opportunities for the future and an explanation of why they take them the next. I think that would be we had a class of fourth graders come to Mudshark yesterday so <laughs> they were very excited